Please welcome Al Arabia news journalist Nadine Harney, who will be hosting the sessions and facilitating our panel discussions. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the EU40 and the Swedish Pavilion, I would like to welcome you to this event entitled The Future of Cancer Care. How can Europe lead the way? Brought to you live from the World Expo here in Dubai. I would like to mention that this is an event hosted by the EU40 and funded by AstraZeneca. My name is Nadine Hani, and I have the pleasure of hosting this event today. Before we start our conversation, I want to mention that we this was supposed to be more of an in-person event, but many of you are instead joining us virtually due to the unprecedented events unfolding in Ukraine. I think given the scale of the conflict, it is only right that we pause to reflect on the human impact that we are very sad to see playing out in front of our eyes by the hour. Many of you have colleagues and friends who are being subjected to unprecedented levels of adversity and danger. We wish them all safety and we hope to see peace once more in Europe and the world. The reason we are gathered today is to discuss a topic which has its own toll on human life. Cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide, accounting for nearly one in six deaths globally, according to the World Health Organization. Europe accounts for a tenth of the world's population, but a quarter of the world's cancer cases, with over 2.7 million cases diagnosed in the EU in 2020. Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, published a year ago, was de developed with the aim to reduce the burden of cancer across the European Union. And it demonstrates the EU's commitment to cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care. This event will explore the current and future actions needed to transform cancer care in the EU. It will consider the next steps in implementing and delivering the vision of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and we'll discuss how European, national and subnational initiatives can be connected for greater impact and the role of collaboration across the cancer ecosystem to continue to improve the lives of people living with cancer across Europe. As health systems consider their long-term resilience and sustainability, as well as recovery from COVID-19, this event will consider how healthcare systems can adopt innovation and deliver the promise of earlier detection, diagnosis, treatment, and personalized cancer care. Today, we will hear from political leaders and industry representatives about how we can work together for a better tomorrow. We are fortunate to have some of the leading voices in the European cancer community today with us. But before we start the conversation, we are very happy to have with us Commissioner General Jan Teslev, who is the Swedish ambassador who assumed the role of Commissioner General of the Swedish Expo 2020 participation. He will provide opening remarks, will welcome you in his own way and set the stage for today's session. Twenty twenty, the forest. A forest is a symbol of um, coexistence, of um, co creation and innovation. And it's with very mixed feelings that we, that I join you instead of you joining me here in Dubai against the backdrop of what is happening as we speak in Europe. As a Swede, as a European, the importance of promoting peace, security, and respecting fundamental rights and values is at the core of what we are all about. But this stresses to us the importance of sticking together, of joining our forces around common challenges. And that's exactly what we are going to do today, to take a closer look at, to dive into the future of cancer care. And we do so thanks to EU40 and with the support of AstraZeneca. Before I dive, I would like to say a few words about Expo 2020. It is a global event. 
it is a global melting pot when it comes to innovation and creativity. And actually, it fits so well with my country as we have in over many years been at the top of global sustainability, innovation and competitiveness rankings. And I'm filled with enthusiasm to be part of this journey. The innovation we see at Expo also ties very well in with this morning's session, during which we will meet, listen to and learn from esteemed panelists. When it comes to innovation, new technologies, in detection, diagnosis and treatment. It can be anything from biomarker testings to artificial intelligence technology that is now taking center stage in diagnosis and personalized therapeutics. In Sweden, in 2020 alone, there were over 60,000 new cancer cases. The most common forms detected were prostate, breast, lung, colon, and melanoma of the skin. And if we look at the European level across Europe, more than 3.7 million new cases, and sadly, 1.9 million deaths each year. In Sweden, we are proud to have a strong cancer society, Cancer Fonden, whose vision is for more people to be cured or to live with good quality of life and good quality of care. The society works to raise the necessary funds to accelerate research when it comes to cancer. In 2020, they dispersed a record 73.8 million euros to cancer research in my country. We also continue to provide world-class cancer care in Sweden. The Karolinska Institute, Sweden's largest medical research institute, has been ranked top 10 for the third year in a row, as late as earlier this month. And in a joint initiative, the Karolinska Institute and the Karolinska University Hospital have been certified as comprehensive cancer centers. We know, we know the importance of improving cancer care. And to do so by the successful implementation of Europe's beating cancer plan that can help turn the tide against cancer. This European plan is aimed at creating a strong European health union that is more secure, better prepared, and more resilient. Some examples of the initiatives that have been taken is the EU network of national comprehensive cancer centers, the Knowledge Center on Cancer, and the European Cancer Imaging Initiative. All of them there to underpin the successful implementation of Europe's beating cancer plan. We in Sweden contribute when it comes to innovation through Vision Zero Cancer. And we do that through our innovation agency, Vinova, that for five years is financing when it comes to prevention, precision, and equity healthcare. To make cancer move from a deadly to a curable or chronic disease. Making sure that more people live longer and better lives. The ambition of Vision Zero Cancer is to provide the tools to research and to innovation, but also to link up research, innovation, governance, and collaboration for a better future. I'm delighted to be here with you today, for those of you who join us virtually, and um, 
I hope that this will be an important step to stick more together, create more together, and innovate more together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner General Lian Teslev, for setting the stage perfectly for the conversation that we are going to have over the next hour. One year on from the publication of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, this session will convene a multi-stakeholder panel of distinguished speakers to explore the initiatives driving Europe's fight against cancer and key policy priorities to shape the future of cancer care. The objectives of this panel are to explore next steps in implementing and delivering the vision of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and other initiatives, to explore the importance of collaboration in the cancer community, and to discuss how healthcare systems can better adopt innovation. We will explore these themes with our esteemed lineup of speakers. Please, please join me in welcoming our speakers who are all joining us virtually today. Ms. Alessandra Moretti, member of the European Parliament and of its Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. She was a member of the Special Committee on Beating Cancer. We have with us also Dr. Bettina Ryel, the chair of the Melanoma Patient Network Europe, the chair of the European Society for Medical Oncology, ESMO, Patient Advocates Working Group, and a former member of the EU Cancer Mission Board. We will also have with us Mr. Greg Rossi, Head of Oncology for Europe and Canada at AstraZeneca, and Dr. Solange Peters, President of the European Society for Medical Oncology, ESMO. Panelists, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. We are very happy to have you with us. Uh, Ms. Moretti, I would like to start with you one year on from the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Uh, we'd like you to uh, make a review and explain to us uh, what have, where have you seen the most progress since the publication of this plan? Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you for this event and for inviting me uh, to take part in it. As you may know, I've been uh, focusing uh, part of my political uh, action as MAP on the fight against uh, cancer since the beginning uh, of the mandate in uh, 2019. Since then, uh, the world has changed. We have uh, been through a pandemic that's caused enormous sufferings also to cancer transient. We are now sadly facing a war in Eastern Europe that, as always in these cases, demands the higher price to be paid by innocent people, including cancer patients. This uh, unfortunate reality, reality shows us uh, once again that cancer patients are among the weakest portions of society. Therefore, we have a duty to protect, to support them, to help them to the best of our ability. I do believe that the fight against cancer must be a comprehensive effort, as cancer is a multifactorial disease. We need to think about the cancer plan as a cross-sectorial engagement of EU public authorities across all policies. Think about the impact of sustainable development and the environment on cancer prevention, the importance of industrial policy and pharmaceutical policy the vital role of education and promotion of healthy lifestyles or the protection of workers against uh, carcinogenic substances. I could go on with many examples. The value of the plan elaborated by the Commission and the contribution given by the European Parliament with the report I just approved are exactly going in this direction. To confirm this, you might want to have a look at uh, to the implementation roadmap that uh, the Commission has just updated last February, which in the next few years includes an unprecedented number of legislative regulatory proposals together with policy coordination activities and EU-wide initiatives in all the interested fields. So I think we are in a decisive time. Hopefully this report will not be disrupted by major international events. The message that I wanted to launch today is that the approval in the parliament is not the end of process, 
but instead the beginning. It's just like a whistle of the referee to start the game. Therefore, as a community, the large and diverse community that fights against cancer need to talk to each other, coordinate the effort and protect the interest of cancer patients. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moretti, just a follow-up question. You mentioned many of the things that uh, need to be done going forward. If you were to pick the priorities, what will be your priorities over the next two years? The coordination uh, um, on this matter is key. Throughout the report approved by the Parliament, we have made reference to the principle of subsidiarity, which is a valid also in this context. Of course, the EU cannot uh, and should not uh, take fully responsibility in this matter because uh, for many things, national and local initiatives are much more effective. What we can do and should do is enforcing a principle. No one has to be left behind. Unfortunately, in the EU, we still have huge differences and discriminations in terms of life expectancy and in terms of surviving cancer. From one little girl that has no access to HPV vaccination to a middle-aged woman who cannot have a screening program for breast cancer or patients that could not be safe of innovative treatments, but they are not marketed in their country. Most of the time, you can solve this problem if you are rich enough to pay for it, but this is not acceptable more. The EU cannot decide how member, a member state runs uh, his uh, healthcare system, but we can and we should build up the next EU health union with binding measures ensuring that our citizens have access to minimum standard services for healthcare. We can do that, the creation of a genuine EU policy in the field of health. Uh, Dr. Bettina Ryle, Ms. Moretti made a very important point, which is uh, the differentiation between national levels, subnational levels, and the alignment of all of that that is needed. But we will discuss that a little bit later on. I would like to stay at the level of the EU, uh, Dr. Ryle, and ask you about the different initiatives there. The EU has been focusing on improving care for cancer patients. In addition to the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, there was the creation of the Mission on Cancer, which you were a member of the former board and it's now renewing its membership. How do you see the integration between the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and the Mission on Cancer? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'd just like to clarify, I'm the former chair of the ESMO Patient Advocacy Working Group, uh, not to take uh, that from my colleague who currently holds the chair. The point here that I think what I found was most impactful since joining the Cancer Mission Board in 2019 was the increasing integration between healthcare, so the beating cancer plan, and the research side for which the mission stood. Mm. And I believe that far, we have already heard from Ms. Moretti how important integration is. And I think integration has to go into many dimensions. And bringing research and healthcare together uh, is for me one of the critical parts. So by background, I'm a physician and I have a PhD in molecular biology. So I have been kind of one leg in one world and the other leg in the other world. And I believe that we will gain speed and improve our care and find the solutions to the problem of inequality that Ms. Moretti so eloquently um, pointed towards in getting a better transition of what we know is possible as a research finding into our healthcare systems. So I am by, uh, by what I spent most of my time on actually is patient advocacy. I founded a European patient network after my husband died of melanoma in 2012 at the age of 37. And what strikes you at that point is that despite all this excitement about innovation and research findings, there seems to be a huge gap between what seems possible and the excitement about innovation and research findings and what is possible when you are that desperate patient who needs access to something and hope to something right now, then. So I believe that is a challenge for all of us to take to ensure that we turn promise into real benefit of patients as fast as possible. 
And I believe actually that the cancer mission and beating cancer plan have shown that it is possible to integrate at high level and then consistently a bit like a zipper, if you want to think about down to the country level and back up again, these two worlds. And I hope that, that we will see progress in that in the next years to come. Thank you. Are you are you more optimistic today than you were? You say you were disappointed at the time that what is possible is not accessible by patients. Do you think that we are on the right track? Yes, I actually I, I have to say that I must say that despite the personal situation I went into, I have I have become more optimistic. I think the more one looks at the issue, one understands where the challenges are. And the moment you understand, you can do something about them. And I do believe that the understanding has dramatically increased. And we are all very much aware of first the COVID crisis and now a war that shows us how important it is to have resilience in our healthcare system, that equity is not just some nice to have we talk about, but substantially influence is the stability of our societies. Instable societies are not resilient. We, have, we will have more issues there. So I think there is a raising awareness that we have to take these things really seriously, that we have to tackle them hands on. So it is from a humanitarian principle that is uh, absolute. I think that is out of the question, but it is for the sake of all of us. And it is not a luxury. It is an essential for the years to come. Dr. Solange Peters, what role can the clinical community play to support Europe's beating cancer plan to help address the cancer care gap? Thanks a lot for the question. Um, this is uh, the beating cancer plan is a, a political initiative in its most noble sense. It's about public policy. So what can we do as being, uh, for me, the ESMO president, European Society for Medical Oncology president, I'm the head of a medical oncology service in a very rich country. So how can we do at each of the level in your institution, at the regional, at the national or at the international level, what can we do? So first of all, let's think, for example, at the level of an international organization, and we have many in oncology. We need to use and to apply the BT Cancer Plan in order to promote uh, and to make it feasible to apply all of its chapter, as well as to connect people around BT Cancer Plan wherever people are. ESMO, for example, is more than 160 countries. And now we created a foundation, which is called the International Cancer Foundation, which is very dear to me because there are many countries that, use, that usually are completely out of the circuit of what we target or who we target with all our political moves. So, I mean, all of the messages beyond Europe and in Europe can be about connections around beating cancer plan paradigms. But at every level, would any nurse, any doctor in his hospital institution or region and in his country promote all of these chapters, it would make BT Cancer Plant a very powerful tool in order to homogenize practices uh, around the world and in Europe. Remember, it is really about diversity. We need to meet diversity of countries and environments, and it's about equity. And we are, as it was said before, very far from there. We need to continue to understand and to potentially start to move uh, with beating cancer plan beyond the terrible events we have, because beating cancer plans is a practical and a financial support to all of these chapters that are very important for cancer care. And remember also how comprehensive it is for all the professionals to listen, who listen to us maybe today. They need to remember that Beating Cancer Plan is an amazingly broad program looking at prevention, screening, vaccines, diagnosis, treatment, quality of care, as well as survivorship. And at each of this level, again, it is about diversity and equity. So, I mean, if you really want to, we want to understand today what we can do is first of all, to try to make sure we are connected, we are knowledgeable about the initiative, and we start day after day to try to implement each of these chapters, sentences, and guidance given by the BT Cancer Plan, wherever we can, starting from home. Dr. Peters, let me ask you about the science, because I know that you have an interest in new biomarker discovery and validation in preclinical and clinical settings. From that perspective, what clinical innovations do you see leading the way in the transformation of cancer care? 
But we spoke be, because spoke before about one of the, uh, I would say, uh, plan, one of the chapters of the BD Cancer Plan is looking at uh, the diagnosis of cancer. And the most important, I would say, topic today is about molecular characterization of cancers, uh, which is representing the big, large bunch of biomarkers we use on the day in daily practice to guide treatment decisions. So when you think about molecular characterization of cancer, uh, this is about biomarkers, my topic of interest in my practice and research. Uh, biomarkers are needed for many reasons. First of all, because when you treat a patient and in a one-to-one -one relationship, you want to make sure as much as possible that what you do will benefit the patient. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the target of your treatment is present in the patient. This is a biomarker. So at an individual basis, at a, a caring kind of point of view, this is very important. But of course, biomarkers go way beyond that. Biomarkers make the whole system sustainable. We tend in oncology and in many fields of medicine to deliver drugs to many patients, knowing that it will benefit the group, but substantially and rationally, it will benefit clinically meaningfully in a minority of these patients. This makes delivering a very expensive drugs very often to a large group of people for a benefit in a subset of them. This is not sustainable, not even in Switzerland. So biomarkers is also about creating through academic initiatives probably, because it has to be an academic, or I would say a state initiative. Uh, we need to create biomarkers in order to make our system sustainable. Unfortunately, and we need to know about it, the um, first move has to come from us and the politicians. It cannot come from the pharma industry who are moving with new companies every day. So this is a kind of, so, uh, of a promotion of academic research here. This will create, once sustainability is defined, that's a basic fundamental need to um, allow ac for accessibility and for inequity in accessibility, what we call access to optimal cancer care. So from the one-to-one -one relationship, you go to a sustainable national system, sustainable international system, and an accessible optimal cancer care. So I think that's, um, that's gonna be probably the most important point everywhere. Molecular assessment of tumor, remember, this is something in the foundation I see every day is far from being met in Europe. There are many countries where molecular diagnosis, as well as all of the pathological diagnosis are difficult to give to the patients or to give to them access to this platform. So first of all, NBT Cancer Plan has it as a priority. We need to make them available to each practitioners, but of course, to each patient in Europe. This again uh, requires collaboration. Mr. Greg Rossi, uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan promotes collaboration between authorities, patients, healthcare professionals, academia, and the health industry to translate the scientific knowledge that we are talking about into innovation that addresses prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management of uh, cancer. What are the areas of collaboration that you anticipate will be the most impactful in transforming cancer care? Thanks, Nadine, and uh, and also thanks to the EU40 and and uh, the other panelists for, for being here. I think these are important conversations. I, th I think the European Beating Cancer Plan um, is both specifically and I think philosophically a great advance in terms of actually putting this on the agenda and and uh, I think highlighting a number of really important elements that we're talking about. Y your question sort of talked about um, knowledge as, as, a, as a key component. And just to build on, you know, uh, Dr. Peters's sort of comment, um, you know, my career has been uh, for the last 25 years thinking about how do we develop evidence and how do we use evidence to improve patient outcomes, working, collaborating with the, the whole ecosystem, whether it's patient groups, whether it's physicians, uh, whether it's policymakers. Um, for me, when I'm thinking about what are the key things about driving innovation and driving impact of innovation, which I think is the important thing, it's a multi-stakeholder event. So if we break this down to uh, some of the elements you had in your question, so let's talk about screening and early detection. Um, this is a critical area. We know that if we identify patients early, um, we have a much better chance of long-term relapse-free survival possibly cure. That's a, that's a, a word that has a, a, a great uh, amount of emotion associated with it. Um, but we know the five-year survival rates, if we identify a patient early, um, are substantially better than those if we identify uh, patients with, with advanced disease. So therefore, screening and early detection has got to be an area that we develop evidence and that we implement 
as part of this uh, beating cancer plan. I think that's going to have a huge impact on the patient outcomes. We heard some of the statistics earlier um, uh, around the, the 4 million patients diagnosed with, with cancer in, the, um, in Europe. Um, I also think that the, the, the area of biomarkers, which Dr. Peters just talked about, is also a critical area for collaboration. And, and you heard some of that. Um, I think today we have um, really remarkable technologies that allow us to characterize a patient's disease at a level of understanding and detail about what drives the biology of that cancer and therefore what might be an appropriate treatment regimen for that patient in ways that we uh, never have been able to before. I mean, there are single tests or whole genome sequencing where we can look at in one go at 500 gene mutations, um, and maybe more, uh, that understand what are the actual specific genetic abnormalities that the cancer has, and therefore, how can we start thinking about the types of treatments, the combinations of treatments that might have the best possible chance for outcome for that individual patient? And then also, as we start to understand how those characteristics are spread across a population of cancer patients. I think um, uh, adopting biomarker testing equitably across the entire European region is a critical part for us being able to really drive, I think, the, the true value of the, uh, the innovations that we already have today. Um, I think the, the treatments we have today are remarkable. I started in cancer research 25 years ago. Uh, when I started, we were trying to work out how to combine chemotherapies that we'd had for 10 or 20 years together uh, without uh, driving you know, uh, un unreasonable toxicities for the patients. Uh, we called it dose-dense chemotherapy. Now, when you look at what we have available in terms of precision medicines, um, we've made some remarkable advances. And actually, in many cancers, you're seeing really true revolutionary outcomes. And I think that comes from a combination of technologies that we have today, whether it's protein engineering, whether it's uh, computational chemistry, whether it's the, uh, the the ability to identify patients through biomarkers, but that is a remarkable set of innovations that we have seen. Um, but we need to make sure that we are adopting uh, what is true breakthrough um, rapidly and equitably across the union. And right now, we see some countries like France or Germany that have got very rapid adoption uh, um, where there is a breakthrough technology almost at the same time as EMEA approval. We're seeing in other countries one or two years delay in the decision even around uh, funding uh, for, for some of these technologies. So I think we need to work better together about how we address that. And then lastly, um, we, we are in the information age. Um, uh, and I started talking about evidence, the generation of evidence about um, how we understand what works well in cancer, how we adopt what we know works in cancer, and how we identify uh, areas for future research. And that's a collaborative thing. But I think if we can integrate these, um, what has historically been siloed data sets together, whether they're genomic, whether they are uh, electronic medical records, whether they are radiological information, and bring that together with the strength of artificial intelligence, we have the opportunity to really, I think, accelerate some of the uh, both uh, learnings, uh, understanding where we should basically prioritize our research efforts, partner with academia, but also how we can basically drive the adoption of what we actually know works and see the inequity that we have across the region to be able to, uh, uh, to raise the, the idea that a patient, whether they're sitting in Lisbon or in Paris, knows that if they have a similar diagnosis, they've got access to similar types of technologies and, and innovation and support. Uh, this takes me perfectly to the question that I want to ask Ms. Moretti, which actually you mentioned before, Ms. Moretti, you mentioned the need for integration between Euro Europe's beating cancer plan, uh, plan at the EU level and then the national and sub-national levels. But my question to you is how, given that the EU, uh, the, the healthcare in the EU is of the national domain, you can have the best plans at the EU level, but if specific governments don't have the budgets, don't have the possibility, the infrastructure to implement uh, recommendations from the EU, then and we don't get to that level of integration that we require. So what, what is the solution? How can you make that happen? The lesson I think that uh, we, we have uh, uh, learned in this uh, very difficult uh, time is uh, that the health must be at the center of any political initiative or any politi public uh, policy. Uh, 
is the precondition of women activity and should not be a matter of other priorities. We learn a lot about that. And without a healthy condition, everything else is empty. Anything else is not possible. From human interaction to being able to work from economic development to any economic activity, nothing is possible if we don't protect and promote our health. That uh, being said, it's also true that the pandemic has shown us how unjust our society still are. I think Ms. Moretti's uh, line broke, so let us try to fix that and get her back on with us. And in the meantime, let me ask you, Dr. Ryle, um, about uh, also a collaboration uh, from Sweden, uh, which is the Vision Zero Cancer. Can you tell us more about it and clarify why and how this has been a model of success to bring innovation to the system and to raise cancer topics in the healthcare agenda? Thank you. So um, just uh, to, to about this vision, so this is just what you see behind me and in honor of my host country, uh, where that has become home for the last 10 years in Swedish. So I think what is interesting about the in initiative Vision Zero Cancer or Norvihun Cancer is that it is an initiative financed by Sweden's innovation agency that is trying to facilitate the introduction of change and innovation into the healthcare system by providing a space where diverse stakeholders from anyone in there, um, in the healthcare system, companies, civil society, academia, and that is actually quite broad. So from my med medical research, but also, for example, economics or political sciences come together to work around a project or a problem based, take a problem based approach to solve issues that are relevant to Sweden. You have already heard a little bit about uh, what in terms of cancer. Um, of course, I'm in melanoma, so unfortunately, the incidence of melanoma is rising here. Uh, lung cancer is a big issue, as in many other countries. and. People with interest in the topic come together and tackle it from their different perspectives, creating one solution that actually works in the local healthcare system here. And I think the, the relevance or the importance to work like that, as we have already heard before, that subsidiarity is one of the fundamental principles of the European Union. And I think it is important to have a concrete or a correct understanding of subsidiarity, because Subsidiarity basically means that we take decisions at the lowest possible level. That doesn't mean that one certain level is right for everything. Sometimes we have to go up, we have to collaborate at European level because we are not able to solve problems at the national level anymore. So because I have like both like the perspective from a European level and as well now as a national level, what I'm particularly interested in is the integration of the two. So where do we have to take decisions? Where are we most effective? Where can we find solutions that are appropriate for our respective countries that are respectful of existing structures, cultural understanding, traditions? What, which kind of solutions make most sense for a given setting? And while at the same time, never forgetting that sometimes one is stronger together. And we have already heard in the introduction that unity is something that we need. And I think that is the challenge to integrate national initiatives like this, that I must say, uh, I've been, it has, it's a real pleasure to work in this type of group because you get a, a speed and an agility that I think we often miss in other settings. So I believe the future of finding solutions to what we call vexing problems lies in creating initiatives, ecosystems. It is actually called an ecosystem, an innovation ecosystem, lies in initiatives at, at um, that level. Healthcare is a complex system. It is actually a complex adaptive system. And if one looks at system change at that level, it requires a certain type of understanding of how these systems function and how we can implement change at that level. And I believe that this system here that the Vision Zero Cancer 
exploits the knowledge around complex adaptive system change uh, very, very well. For those who are familiar with this type of innovation, it is based on an earlier Swedish initiative, which was Zero Death in Traffic, which has also inspired the Vision Zero Cancer and the other four missions in this set of five missions launched at the European level. And I believe that if we really want to make progress and want to make it fast, we have to spend time, oddly enough, on thinking how we work together. Because in the end, it is about people coming together who are bringing their own perspective, their own interest, and those are absolutely valid, but who have to kind of agree on the next step. And that only works if one has a way to facilitate it, a space where people can act as equal partners to come together to build something that none of them alone would have been able to achieve. So um, it is a real honor to, to work in this setup. Um, I've actually learned a lot. I hope I have been able to contribute. And I do think that um, and there are similar initiatives for example in the Netherlands there is a is a mission driven innovation ecosystem called Health Holland and other countries are building similar initiatives so I think for the future for all of us um, this is an initiative that is very sweet in its essence but the principles and the learnings are Can valid. Be replicated. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moretti, you are back with us live. I want to give you the chance to uh, continue what you were discussing about the integration between the EU level, national and uh, subnational yes. levels, and what you think are the main challenges to overcome to achieve th that kind of integration in strategies. Thank you. Sorry for my connection. Yes, uh, I said before, I think that uh, uh, without healthy condition, everything else is uh, simple impossible. No? for human interaction to be able to work from economic development to any economic activity. Nothing is possible if we don't protect and promote our health. That being said, it's also true that uh, the pandemic uh, has shown us uh, uh, and just our societies uh, uh, still are. The consequences of the pandemic uh, have been felt anywhere in the world. But more developed countries have been able to react faster and faster. Too many people in poorer areas of the world have been left alone without access to healthcare services and later on with limited access to vaccination. Also within richer countries, inequalities have been widespread and lower income portions of society have been hit harder. So, therefore, I believe that it's our duty as politicians to reaffirm the value of universal, of public and free healthcare services where patients and citizens are in the center of public health policies and profits and private interests. Don't interfere with the right of everyone to high level protection and healthcare services. So, I think that we have a huge responsibility in this field. We need to build the European Union of Health because no one country is able to, to uh, react alone. We need a union of the health because uh, in this uh, field uh, we understood that that is fundamental work together, not only with uh, uh, the state's uh, organization, but with associations like your, with a uh, uh, company, private company like AstraZeneca. So we need to um, build a, pro a common project about that. And so in this way, we can uh, win uh, this uh, very, very um, difficult battle. Uh, Dr. Peters, ESMO's response, response to the Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Plan highlights some areas that you as an organization um, want to focus on, including the standards, standardization of care. Uh, how can we monitor and track progress and improvements in quality of life and outcomes across Europe? Thank you for the question. Of course, organizations like, like ESMO and, and our cousins have the difficulty of not sitting beside the patients. So what we can mainly create is the framework, the skeleton uh, of uh, what people would need uh, in their daily practice or might apply being to treat patients, but being also to try to mount any public policy or political initiative because it's needed where they practice. So what we can really deliver is uh, our tools and our educational material, as well as our voice 
in order to support every physician, every professional, every nurse, uh, and every patient advocate group, wherever they are. What can we do? Of course, we cannot cover all this huge, um, I would say, uh, um, number of fields that the Beating Cancer Plans uh, is already envisaging, but we have been working and we are probably prioritizing some of these uh, specific contents and tools that we would like to deliver to our community. So first of all, uh, we have to keep in mind that everything we do should follow what we call evidence-based medicine. If you don't follow this medicine, the risk is not to harm or maybe to harm, but the most important uh, risk you face is not to give the optimal. And for me, the optimal is the only aim we should follow. So that's the reason why we try and we continue to be very active in giving guidelines, in writing guidelines, in making guidelines across all types of of diseases available to all our members. We are now envisaging with the foundation to go into uh, our adapted guidelines or recommendations for various environments where probably it would be more difficult to apply the new fancy drugs, or maybe it wouldn't be desirable to lose a lot of time to try to, to, to have them. So it's quite important to still take into account different environments in order to provide optimal care. I'm used to travel to many continents, particularly Africa this last month, and I can tell you that in some countries, Adapted guidelines would be way more useful than our current guidelines. The guidelines is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, of course, never to forget anyone on the road, and there are some rare diseases. And rare diseases are usually really let apart in terms of drug accessibility, in terms of patient's consideration, and even to constitute a patient group when you suffer from rare disease is not an easy task. So we have a, a very active contribution to Rare Cancer Europe, which is a wonderful community, and about policy and applying BT Cancer Plan, it's a very important group never to forget. We, of course, have to work on uh, accessibility. This is high level politics, but it's probably to me the most passionisting step. What does it mean? It means that this concept of subsidiarity, right, has to look at how the drugs can reach the patient. So it means that, uh, of course, for non expensive drug, it's time to end the shortages, right? Even in my country, uh, every six months, I have a shortage of a very inexpensive drug like cisplatin, right? Why would you have to face that? Just because it's inexpensive and we don't have subsidiarity in order to make sure that one place can be replaced by another one to produce. So that's something that it's unacceptable at the time of COVID, of the war, and also in normal times. We need to be able to secure that. In terms of um, expensive drugs, we have to work hand in hand with the pharma industry to try to build together what the WHO is working on, which is the fair pricing of a compound. We are not naive. Huh? The pharma industry has to make profits in order to create innovation. But the whole paradigm on how, how to apply this pricing and how we can potentially try to find a good balance. It's something to work with the pharma industry. So a second thing, of course, is reimbursement model. We end up now with a huge initiative with the London School of Economics in order to make sure that once you have a fair price for a drug, it's going to be reimbursed diversely depending if you live in Ukraine or if you live in Switzerland, because we shouldn't be naive. These reimbursement models will allow the dialogue with the pharma industry. So these are the very important initiatives are just examples that we try to follow. Last but not least, quality of care is something that we try to implement. We started with a very important one of palliative care, with now as a certification of the centers who deliver quality of care in the end of life step. And there are even countries uh, way outside of Europe being now certified. And I think it's a good start to try to see how we can potentially certify the most important inhomogeneous practices. And unfortunately, end of life is one. Mr. Rossi, in your opinion, what are the innovations with the most significant impact on health systems across the EU? For example, test, uh, testing, uh, targeted treatments, data infrastructure. How can we better harness these types of innovations at a country level? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, we've discussed a number of them, and I think it's uh, you, you, you mentioned testing, I think targeted treatments and, 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 and data, and I think it's all of the above. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, if I think about the the innovation that's going on right now in terms of early detection, um, there's really some remarkable work that's going on in uh, what we call liquid biopsy. So, so uh, fairly um, easy, accessible 
uh, I think samples, um, you know, blood samples and others that we can look at um, and identify the uh, cancer earlier than we've ever been able to before. Um, now, that may not be the sensitivity we need in all cancers, but I think that those liquid biopsies are going to be transformational in terms of identifying patients and, and allowing us to have uh, early diagnosis and therefore the, the greatest chance of cure. Um, some of those technologies, by the way, could be multi-cancer detection systems. So we could detect you know, uh, not just one cancer, uh, like we can with, let's say, cervical or CRC or breast cancer um, uh, screening, but actually up to 50 different cancers with one sample. So I think there's some remarkable technologies that are coming that we need to, to develop the evidence for and then think about how fast we can basically move uh, those into, uh, into routine clinical practice. Um, you also talked about targeted th treatments. I, I think we, we, uh, we've seen over the last 20 years um, uh, the advance of these things. And I think you know, even today, we're now, uh, with the technologies we have available, we are um, hitting targets in cancer that we uh, used to call undruggable. Um, uh, and the, the ability to take either an intracellular target or a cell surface target, or even a target that is not in the tumor cell itself, but in the, in the system of cells, whether it's the immune system or others that interact with the tumor, um, and to be able to, to start thinking about uh, how we put together a, a, a regimen that, that really interacts with the biology of the cancer, I think is, is remarkable. But I think the main one, and I think this is where Europe uh, uh, has a, both an opportunity and a risk, um, is around data and data infrastructure. We've, we've heard about evidence um, and evidence-based medicine uh, and uh, how we can make sure that we adopt what we know works. Uh, and I think that uh, guideline adherence and guideline development uh, is, is a critical part of that. But we've got to be able to measure it. You know, we've got to be able to know what, what um, patients are receiving, um, which hospitals, which systems are, are um, uh, adopting uh, those guidelines. Um, if they're not, why not? Because there are good reasons sometimes. Uh, why not? So that can we understand um, the, uh, uh, the, the patient level information uh, at the right, um, right level? And how can we share that so that we can drive the innovation to where we really need um, uh, to, to innovate, where there's high unmet need? Uh, and how can we basically adopt that rapidly? So I think it's really around data that um, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity because this is information science. Um, and I do think that we see in the US, for example, uh, some really strong partnerships and initiatives. Um, we haven't yet uh, seen those fully in Europe. Um, uh, and I think we need to sort of think through both the legal, uh, the, the philosophical uh, and the practical aspects of data integration and data ownership to be able to make sure that researchers can uh, really work together to, uh, to innovate and drive uh, even better outcomes. Um, Dr. Peters, I want to ask you about this part because um, a key, a key uh, component of what you were discussing earlier is the use of data and safe uh, use of patient data, building the appropriate data infrastructure within and across countries. Uh, how can we develop appropriate data protection to build trust across the healthcare systems uh, to harness the power of data? Thanks a lot. First of all, we have a complex data protection regulations in Europe, right? With the application uh, recently, uh, two years ago, three years ago, of the new GDPR data protection rules, uh, we felt like it's a step uh, in securing privacy of patients and uh, a right and a correct use of their private and own data, but also it created some barriers in understanding how to share data create registries, and we had to face it very dramatically at the time of COVID, where registries were slowed down by this regulation. So data protection has to be really understood and now managed in a way which takes into account the limitation, but takes, makes it as efficient as possible. Unfortunately, I guess the COVID times had taught us how to move with this data protection. Because we had to, in emergency, we had to produce some data about how our patients with cancer when do, were doing when they were suffering from COVID. But uh, this learning process was a difficult one. So that's a starting point. This is not going to change. The GDPR, the European Data Protection, is a complex, I would say, skeleton, a complex context that we have to live with. But more importantly, 
there is a political move here that we can potentially add to this uh, data uh, mining and data protection that we speak here, is the creation and the acceptance of real world data. We all have databases in our hospitals and in our countries. These data are usually collected in a quite systematic way and homogeneous way. And we continue sometimes to treat patients to know what these data we already have would tell us. So what I mean is we have to find a way, and it's a long-standing argument we have with regulatory authorities that the politicians help us about this too. We need to pave the way of acceptance of real-world data. This will, of course, make everything we do more acceptable and allow us to use the best efforts we made uh, about public policy, very useful in order to immediately benefit the patients about treatment strategies, outcome, preferences, opportunities. So that's maybe uh, the positive point. We have a strong data protection, but using it and handling it the right way, we might create a context of high quality real world data. And only high quality real world data, maybe at some point, might be used to dictate help and support treatment decisions. Uh, our time is running out, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, I hope we can give concise answers. Ms. Moretti, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that COVID, of course, strained uh, budgets. And uh, my question is, uh, what can you do to help reduce inequalities? And also, what are the main takeaways from COVID? Uh, on, on one hand, COVID has suppressed uh, uh, early detection. On the other hand, there are, it, uh, it, we have learnings about the delivery and organization of care. What is the one thing that you hope will change the future of cancer care? In Europe? I think that uh, we have a very important challenge in front uh, of us and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will win uh, if uh, we will able to work uh, together in the field of uh, the human rights because uh, we know, we understood very well um, that uh, health is uh, the most important right that we have. So we, we need, we have, uh, we have a huge duty to protect uh, public health care system. And uh, we have to realize it where it's uh, not possible to say, yes, citizens have a public health system. So uh, there are many countries in Europe in which there are many, many discriminations in which citizens are not sure to have access in the public health care system. And uh, in the other hand, we need to reinforce the public health system where there is a public health care system. In my country, for example, in Italy, we have a public health system care, but we need to reinforce it to change because uh, COVID uh, um, showed us that uh, everything is very, very weak and public health care system in Europe are very weak. So we need to reinforce, we need to help countries to create a new model. And uh, this challenge also in the field of the cancer um, uh, field is very important to, to help them. But uh, I think that uh, um, European Cancer Plan is uh, only the beginning, is the, the first step. And uh, we, we have to, to fight uh, more and more, and we have to fight together. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask you all for closing remarks as well, uh, Dr. Bettina Ryle. I can actually just add to that. It's not just the willingness that we need to work together. We also have to invest in techniques and thinking about how we do this effectively and rapidly. Willing is the starting point, but being really good at it is then the next step. Thank you. Dr. Peters. Or maybe just one word. We are experiencing humbling lessons about how collaboration is needed uh, and uh, potentially the uh, our, our outcome uh, of this uh, terrible events will be that in the future we will build better back because we need to catch up, to catch up on non-communicable diseases. So that's my hope out of the pain uh, is to find resources in the future. 
Ms. Moretti, I know you, uh, you g gave uh, most of your ideas, but I'm going to give you the chance again to, to close before I pass it on to Mr. Rossi. I think that uh, with the cancer plan, European cancer plan, uh, we put uh, um, a, a huge uh, resources to, to fight cancers and uh, to research. I think that the, the, the key is uh, to give uh, money to the research. Research is essential for us. And uh, we need to create and to support the research. And I think that uh, there will be a, a, a strong alliance between us, between uh, public institutions and between a private company uh, the, the world of the pharmaceutical uh, uh, societies, we can, we have to work together. But public uh, needs to, to um, believe more and more in uh, also in uh, research. It's not, uh, it's not easy, but, uh, but now we have resources. And I know that also the private sector will do uh, a, a, a very important action for the future. Mr. Rossi. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about uh, um, the burden of cancer um, and the um, the needs uh, going forward, and I think that that's right and proper. And the I think EU cancer plan addresses a number of those things. Uh, I just look back a little bit and say, actually, over the last twenty years, we've made phenomenal advances as well. I think that we, we know that the, the burden of cancer is, remains significant, but I think the advances we've made actually should give us a lot of optimism for what we're going to face in the future and how we can accelerate that. And I think that the, uh, the challenge is, is, is not just to, to innovate, uh, which, is, which is clearly there, but it's also to make sure that we um, are adopting what we know works, um, and that we're doing that equally across the, uh, um, uh, the region, uh, and then working together to really be able to uh, uh, make sure we're focusing our innovation on the right areas that have the biggest impact, both from a societal point of view, from a patient point of view. And I think we can do that together. And I think that we've actually got a very bright uh, next 20 years. Panelists, thank you very much for a very insightful conversation and for giving us hope for a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. This is the end of today's EU40 event discussing the future of cancer care. How can Europe lead the way? I think the key messages from today's conversations are that plans and visions for the future of cancer care in Europe are ambitious, but collaboration is key to achieving their aims. So the cancer community must work together to reach this goal. New innovations in personalized cancer treatment and care require flexible and innovative health systems, long-term sustainable investment and strong partnerships countries across Europe should implement robust national strategies with concrete and measurable targets to prevent, treat and one day cure cancer. Thank you very much for tuning in. It was my pleasure to host this event. Goodbye.